Hi, my name is Jeff Petraka, and I'm an educator at the DNA Learning Center at Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you for joining us for part two of our experiment in uh, learning how to use PCR to detect the presence of genetically modified components in uh, various different snack foods. So I wanted to sort of share my uh, presentation here with you guys. go. All right. So just as a reminder, if you watched part one, or if you haven't, I would encourage you to do so before you watch part two. Uh, just remember that the purpose of this lab was to try to figure out if we could find evidence of genetically modified plant components within various different snack foods. And we looked at, in particular, a cheesy corn chip as well as a veggie straw yesterday. And uh, uh, what we did was we began by isolating DNA from both of those snack foods. And if you remember, I also isolated DNA from a positive and negative control, uh, GMO corn that is, and non-GMO corn. And then we went ahead and amplified whatever DNA we found by the process known as polymerase chain reaction or PCR. And we amplified two particular things. We ampl amplified a uh, genetic transgene that's a common component of uh, genetically modifying plant organisms called 35S. It's a promoter from the cauliflower mosaic virus. And we also amplified the tubulin gene. And the tubulin gene served as a control for us, or will serve as a control for us, because all plants should have that, regardless of whether or not they've been modified uh, by humans. So for today, what we're going to do is take a look at the results of those PCR products uh, by the process known as gel electrophoresis. Now, this is where we'll actually be able to visualize our PCR products and our DNA and see whether or not we actually got successful amplification of both tubulin as well as 35S. We're also going to uh, do a few bioinformatics exercises. And bioinformatics is the sort of the study of how to deal with uh, large sort of data sets of uh, um, biological data, such as genetic information. And we're going to be going through some exercises on the computer uh, with that. So just as a reminder, the 35S promoter, that's the, the element of genetically modified plants that we were looking at yesterday, is a promoter. And being a promoter, it is incorporated into to genetically modified components or genetic components in order to ensure the transcription or the expression of particular genes of interest that a genetic engineer might want to incorporate into a crop. And so if you take a look on the screen here up at the top left, we see a plasmid. And a plasmid, as a reminder, I sort of went over that briefly yesterday, is a small ring of DNA. And uh, a plasmid might want to, might be a good sort of um, vector or a base, basically a trans order for a genetic engineer to construct in order to incorporate a particular gene of interest. Now, if we look at that plasmid, we have our gene of interest up here in green. So that could be anything from like we mentioned yesterday, the BT gene. So basically a, a toxin that would confer resistance against various different types of insect larvae, in particular butterflies and moths. So we might want to incorporate that gene into the plasmid. And then right before it, we would incorporate a promoter. That's our promoter, actually, our 35S promoter. And that's just a highly efficient promoter. So we can be sure that that gene of interest will be expressed. Notice that also we have over here an origin of replication, as well as a uh, something called antibiotic resistance. And this is just serving as a selected agent to make sure um, that to actually select for our, our sort of recombinant cells. And that's sort of not something I want to get into now. And the origin of replication is just there to make sure that that uh, plasmid can actually replicate itself and get transferred to other cells down the line. So we talked about the BT gene yesterday, but another example of a, a gene that a, a, a grower might want to incorporate into his or her crops would be the HT gene or herbicide resistance gene. And so basically, if you think about being a farmer, for instance, you know, if you are growing a acres and acres of corn, you have to deal with weeds somehow because weeds are always going to find any little uh, bit of free soil that they can and start growing. And so some of those weeds might be better at extracting nutrients from the soil than the corn, than your crop, your crop plant will be. And so you need to figure out a way to get rid of those weeds in a very efficient way. 
Okay. And so you might want to use a, a herbicide such as Roundup Ready. But if you use this generalist herbicide on your crops, you're going to not only kill the weeds, but also kill your corn or your crop. Therefore, the HT gene uh, essentially incorporates or rather confers the ability of your crop to be able to resist a that that Roundup Ready herbicide and essentially allows it to grow even in the presence of that herbicide. So basically, if without that gene, like the weeds, they're going to all sort of die and you'll be able to uh, um, uh, quickly and efficiently weed your crop and, and eliminate them uh, without them causing any harm or to your yield as a farmer. That's the idea. So anyway, what we did yesterday, as a reminder, we amplified our DNA through the process of PCR. Now that took about an hour and a half or so. Uh, today, what we're going to do is take a look at those PCR products through a process known as gel electrophoresis. So um, I'm going to kind of show you this before we sort of describe this. And basically, before you guys got here, I went ahead and made up, up a gel for us. And this is a 2% agarose gel. A paper towel here. So you can see right up here, this is basically just fancy science jello. That's all it is. And so if I can, I slide it off of this thing right here. This is actually a casting tray. This is sort of like the jello mold. And I went ahead and warmed up some agarose, got it nice and uh, hot, and I poured it into this casting tray. I used these little tools here. These are called cones. And these little cones basically left behind little depressions in the gel. So basically, if you look at our gel here, you can see sort of little holes, little slits. Those are called wells. Those are depressions in the gel that uh, where our samples are actually going to get loaded uh, today. And so this is a double comb gel, meaning that there are 16 wells on this gel right now. And now the reason that we're doing this is because we can't see DNA. So uh, when we actually here, I'll show you now, I'm going to take our samples out of our thermal cycler here. And if you notice, it's purple, it's, you know, it's, it's got, got color to it, but we can't actually see the DNA. The DNA is clear. You're not going to be able to visualize it. So we need to sort of use another technique in order to actually see our, our DNA itself. And inside of this gel, there is a chemical known as gel red, and that is going to serve as our DNA stain. Gel red is a DNA intercalator, and it basically inserts itself right into, uh, right between the base pairs of DNA, wherever it encounters it. So if I put DNA into this gel, it's going to start inc incorporating itself between the base pairs of DNA, and it will glow underneath the black light. Now, I just so happen to have a black light right here. So we'll be able to take a look at that later. But then, of course, we don't want to just put our samples in the well. We want to actually be sure that the DNA that we're seeing actually is tubulin or 35X. So that's where the electrophoresis part comes in. So this box right here is called an electrophoresis chamber. And I'm basically going to just take my casting tray here with gel and all, and I'm going to drop it right into that electrophoresis chamber. Now notice that there is a liquid in the electrophoresis chamber. You can see it's sort of swirling around in there. That's called a buffer. And it's basically just a solution of ions. At least that's what we're using it for here today. So the process of electrophoresis separates out DNA on the basis of size. And it uses the electrical charge of DNA to do that. So if you recall back from our uh, part one video or just Honestly, any of the videos on our DNA LC live page, we constantly go over the structure of DNA. And one of the components is the phosphate group in the DNA backbone. The phosphates, of course, have a negative charge. So therefore, DNA as a whole has a pretty high negative charge. So we're going to use that to our advantage in order to separate out our DNA in the gel. Now, you can think of a gel kind of like a traffic jam on a busy highway. So the gel particles are actually poly, they're actually polysaccharides, they're agarose molecules, they're, they're um, uh, it's a sugar derived from a seaweed, and they're all essentially all cram packed into next to each other. And so they're kind of like the cars in a traffic jam. Little tiny pieces of DNA are going to have a very easy time getting through that traffic jam. They're almost like motorcycles, they'll be able to sort of weave in and out of the little traffic jam. Larger pieces of DNA are going to be like a coach bus or a tractor trailer. They're not going to have an easy time of getting through the gel. 
So when I turn on this gel box, this electrophoresis chamber, an electrical field will be set up in the gel box and the negatively charged DNA will be pulled through the electric field towards the other end of the gel box, basically the other side of the wells, away from the wells. And uh, so basically, you notice on our power supply here, this is actually the connected to, this is actually connected to the power supply right here. Um, there's a black wire and a red wire. The black wire here has, uh, uh, connects to the anode, that's the negatively charged electrode. The red wire here connects to the positively charged electrode, that's the cathode. And so if you notice the way that this box is gonna be set up, the positively charged end is closer to you guys looking at me and the black electrode is further away, closer to my fridge over here, okay? That's the idea. So basically we're gonna be able to separate out our samples on the basis of their size. So let's go ahead and get that started. So remember I did the positive and negative controls yesterday. Uh, as well as the the cheesy snack and the cheesy corn chip, corn chip rather, and the um, veggie straw. And so inside of these tubes right now, I have each of those samples. Now, remember, I did a couple of extra samples, so we're going to just ignore those. Forget about those. We're just worried about these four. And remember, I set up two different PCR reactions. These are the PCR reactions for 35S. In the machine here, I still have the PCR reactions for tubulin. Now, I'm going to load these in the gel in a very specific way. I'm going to basically take my tubulin sample for, like, let's say, the cheesy corn chip, and I'm going to load it first. Then I'm going to load right next to it the 35S. And every single time, I'm going to load about 18 microliters. So let me go ahead and get that started. <clears throat> So I'm gonna actually start with the positive and negative controls here. I'm gonna check on my pipette here that we are set for the right volume, which we are. And I'm going to reach across the, you should never load a gel like this, by the way, but I'm gonna reach across the table and go ahead and basically load that right in to the gel. Now, every single time that I do this, I'm going to change my tip just as a reminder. We don't want to intermix our samples here just because they each contain different things. We don't want to uh, get sort of confusing results that we're not going to be able to interpret. So we want to keep everything sort of separate. So I'm doing the positive control first. Now, when I load the gel, the other thing that you have to pay attention to is you're going to deposit your sample directly into the well every single time. So we don't want to inject it into the gel or into the buffer because otherwise it'll float away. We don't want that. So I'm taking extra care, extra care just to make sure that when I go into the well, I'm actually getting it in the well. That's the positive and negative control. Let's go ahead and do these snack foods. So here's my cheesy corn chip. And again, I'm going to do tubulin first. Then I'm going to load right next to it the 35S. So I didn't really focus on PCR yesterday just because a lot of our labs sort of focus on PCR. And I wanted to focus more on just the topic itself for this presentation. But Remember that PCR specifically will try to amplify DNA. So it targets a very specific region in DNA. So there's a lot of DNA that went into those tubes, remember. Probably some of my DNA when I was touching the chip. Um, there's probably bacteria, viral DNA, et cetera. And then whatever is left of the plant genome that the, the snack foods are made up of. And so PCR will specifically target There we go. We'll specifically target just the tubulin and the 35S that I want it to. And the reason that it will do that is because of the primers. Now, remember, primers 
are a they're tiny little pieces of DNA. They're, they're small pieces of DNA, anywhere from like 20 to 40 base pairs in life. And they're the sort of specific targeters that we will use to identify our gene region of interest. So the one set of tubes for 35S all had 35S primer. The one tube for tubulin, tube set that all that had uh, that were labeled for tubulin all had tubulin primer. So we can be sure that whatever came out of our thermal cycler yesterday was basically either just tubulin or just 35S. So now, to be clear though, I'm not too sure how big those fragments are, or at least you guys aren't yet. But we're gonna find out how big those fragments are, is run a reference marker. And so in this tube here, I have what's called 100 base pair ladder. And 100 base pair ladder is kind of like a control in a way. It is a mixture of DNA fragments of specific sizes, and I know what those sizes are. So basically, um, 100 base pair ladder, that there are pieces of DNA in here that are about 1,000 base pairs in length. There are pieces that are 900 and 800 and 700, 600, and all the way on down to 100. So it's kind of like a DNA ruler in a way. It's going to run in our gel at the same rate as the rest of our samples. So if we compare the pattern, the run pattern of our ladder to each of our individual samples, we'll be able to kind of get an idea of an estimate of what the size of each one of our samples are. So the tubulin or the 35S, for instance. Okay. And don't worry if you are kind of asking yourself, well, how do we know how big tubulin or 35S is supposed to be? That's our next step. We're actually going to use the primers to try to figure out how big each of those regions of DNA are. But first, let me load the ladder. And I'm going to put the ladder in the first well in each row of our gel here. So now that that's done, I'm going to go ahead and put the top on our gel box here. And now I can set the power supply. And I'm going to set the power supply for 130 volts. So basically, when I set it for 130 volts, I'm setting up a, an electrical potential difference or an electrical field in the box that carries a, uh, that has an electrical potential of 130 volts. Just about basically the amount of energy that's that's influencing the DNA in the box. Now you don't want to have too high of a voltage because you might uh, damage your DNA in the process. Um, but if you increase the voltage, theoretically, you'll increase the speed at which your your bands will go through the gel. I'm also going to set a timer here just because I tend to forget, walk away, and forget things. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this at 30 minutes. There we go. Okay. And so if uh, you can't really see it now, but if you look in the gel box here, you'll see little bubbles, little soda fizzy bubbles coming up on either ends of the gel box. And that just tells you that the uh, gel is up, that the uh, uh, electrophoresis chamber is functioning. Okay. So right now, the electric field is going to be acting on our DNA and it's going to pull it through the gel. Uh, over time and basically smaller pieces of DNA are going to go a little bit further than larger pieces. That's the idea. So let's let that sit for a little bit and let's get back to our presentation. Okay, so this is where we left off. So here's how I loaded the gel just as a reminder. So we have our 100 base pair ladder in the first well of each, uh, each lane of wells here or each row of wells. And then each one of our samples, we have the tubulin and 35S side by side. So basically in this image here, number one would be like our positive control. Number two would be our negative control. Number four would be our cheesy corn chip. And number, uh, well, imagine you have another one here, number five, that would be our, our veggie, veggie stick. And that's the idea. Okay, so we'll check back on that at the end of our presentation. But for now, let's figure out exactly how to figure how to how to come up with the size or the expected size of our fragments. We want to be sure that what we're seeing is actually 35S and actually tubulin, right? We don't want to just come up with some random. We don't we want we don't want to see random like patterns on our gel and 
and assume that they are tubulin and 35S. We want to be extra sure. So we want to kind of get an idea of how big um, our fragments, our, our, uh, our amplicons should be for each of the different uh, PCR amplicons. So we're going to do that by using our primers. We're going to do a bioinformatics exercise. So now I have both sets of primers in the student lab protocol that is attached to this presentation on the DNA LC live page. So you can, you guys can go ahead and pull those and mess around with them as you, as you wish. But for now, if you want to just follow along, that's totally cool as well. And so basically remember, actually, let's take a step back for a second. I want to sort of show you guys, hold on one sec. Let's take a step back. I want to show you exactly what I mean by primers. Whiteboard. Where's my smart board? Okay, there we go. All right, so you guys should be seeing a little smart board uh, image here. And what I'm going to show you is just what I mean by primer. So imagine that we have a piece of DNA. So here is one backbone. Here's the other. And then somewhere within this piece of DNA, we have our, let's just by rant, let's just randomly choose 35S. So here is our 35S. I'm gonna just kind of mark, demarcate that on the drawing like this. Okay, so imagine that that's 35S. So basically this just represents the sequences of bases starting here and ending here that represent that promoter 35S. So those primers that we chose or that I, I combined into our, our samples are basically little baby primers that would bind, you know, I, can't, I chose the wrong picture here, I guess, <laughs> the wrong auto shape. Let's just say that we have one primer here and we have another primer down here. So that's why there are two primers in that sort of data set that I, I have on the on the uh, presentation, just because we need a forward and a reverse primer. So again, they're basically just specific pieces of DNA that will that will bind upstream and downstream of, of our gene region of interest. So when, during PCR, when our primers recognize, the primers that I incorporated into that, that PCR tube yesterday, when our primers uh, recognize the complementary uh, regions before and after our 35S, they're they're going to go ahead and bind and they are both going to be amplified. So one primer is going to go that way. They're going to be amplified in that direction. And another primer is going to be amplified and the other primer, the reverse primer is going to be amplified that way. So hopefully that makes sense. And so what that shows then is that this is going to be the size of our amplicon. So basically whatever comes out of PCR should just be 35S and possibly some flanking regions and the primers themselves. Okay, so that's what we're trying to figure out the size of. And I remember now I didn't go deeply into PCR yesterday, but uh, recall that PCR is going to amplify our gene regions or our target our target regions of interest over a billion times. So basically, that little pink tube should have theoretically just contained, for all intents and purposes, just 35S or just tubulin. That's why this works so well. Um, so let's go back to our, let's go back to, let's actually go to the, the um, Google for a second. So we want to basically use our primer. Actually, hold on, let's go back to the presentation. I'm sorry. We want to use our primers to predict the size of our amplicon. So we want to figure out exactly how many base pairs 35S actually is. So we're going to use a tool called BLAST in order to do that. But first, we need the primer. So I'm going to go ahead and copy these primers. And then I'm going to go back to good old Google. There we go. And what I want, what I want to do is go to GenBank. So I'm going to go ahead and click this here, just because I already typed that in. I'm going to go to GenBank. And GenBank is essentially a database full of sequence information from scientists throughout the US and around the world. And basically it is 
kind of like if you've ever been to a botanical garden or something like that, and you, you may have walked around and seen like a little metal tag hanging off of a plant uh, with numbers and information on it. Basically, those tags are kind of like just contain information for the curators of the garden to keep track of that particular specimen in their collection. And GenBank is essentially the same way, except it's electronic and it's just DNA sequence. So what nifty little tool that it has, if you go to this little pull down menu here, is this BLAST tool. And that stands for Basic Local Alignment Search Tool. So if you're in AP biology or anything like that, you, you probably are familiar with this or you should be because it is an important concept on the AP. Um, and basic local alignment search tool essentially is a tool that allows you to take a bit of sequence information and compare it to everything in GenBank's database. And so I'm gonna do nucleotide blast. So I'm just basically using nucleotides uh, to form my basis of comparison. So I'm gonna click that. And when you do, you come to this page here and there's a little query box up here where you can input sequence information. That's actually where I'm going to paste my primers. Now, remember, I don't know what primer this is. I don't know if this is for 35S or if it's for tubulin. I really have no idea. So we're gonna find out now. Now, the only thing is uh, we don't want any of this stuff. Basically, we just want sequence entered in a FASTA uh, format. We don't want any of the other nonsense there. So I'm gonna basically get rid of all this we just want ATCs and Gs, basically. So remember, one of these is the forward primer, and the other is the reverse primer. So there's my forward, there's my reverse. So now, before I go ahead and continue here, I am actually going to scroll down a little bit, and I want to make sure that I have this little, where it says Program Selection Optimization. I want to make sure that somewhat similar sequences are uh, checked off here, just because it defaults to this one, highly similar sequences. And these are such small little pieces of DNA that it's going to have a hard time finding a match. So uh, we want to go to somewhat similar sequences when you're doing primer searches. I don't know what this is. I'm not sure what that's all about, so I'm just going to get rid of that. <laughs> all right. So once I have my, my query entered, I'm going to hit blast. And so what's going to wind up happening is uh, um, your query will be compared to all of the different sequences in GenBank's database um, via what's called an alignment. So basically trying to match up the base pairs and uh, aligning them right next to each other. So sometimes this takes a few seconds, hopefully not too long. There we go. Sorry for the delay there, but we seem to be all good. Okay, so what you're going to see is, you're going to see some stuff up here, but let's not even, I don't want to focus on that. Let's go down to the descriptions. So basically, here are our matches. Here are our sequences that produce significant alignments. And so you'll see a whole bunch of crazy stuff here that, you know, a lot of you, know, a lot of you guys may not be familiar with. I don't even know what half of this stuff is. Um, but what I do notice, though, is I see some common themes. I see the word 35S sort of intercalated into the results here, interestingly. So basically, what each one of these represents are different sequences that have, that have been published to GenBank. And notice over here on the right, you see a number, usually a couple letters, then a whole bunch of numbers. And with that, that's called an accession number. So each one of these accession numbers essentially is kind of like that identifier number that would be found linked to a plant in a botanical garden, except this accession number is used to associate DNA sequences. And basically that just contains a record of whatever information that has been published along with the sequence. So it might contain information about, about what, if it's a gene, what it's for, it might contain information about who published it, uh, where it came from, what journal it was published in, et cetera. And then of course it contains information about the sequence itself. So that's what that set of numbers is on the right-hand side. Uh, you'll see some other numbers here. And for, for us, for sort of analytical purposes, these are kind of more important. So 
right off the bat, you'll notice this identity, so this percent identity. So all of these are 100% matches. And basically what that means is that our query that we entered, that is our sort of forward and reverse primer sequence, had has formed a 100% match to at least part of uh, whatever this sequence is that's been published. Uh, in fact, you'll see some other things as well. So for instance, we have over here, we have an E value. So this is a probability value, essentially. So if you're familiar with statistics, it's kind of like kind of like the p-value in many ways, because it's like the lower the p-value, uh, the more significant that your match is. So you really are looking for a very low e-value here. Um, you're also looking for higher uh, score values here. Now there are both max score and total score. And basically these are metrics that um, GenBank uses to assign how good of a match uh, your particular query, your, your particular alignment is for each one of the respective sequences. But uh, notice that a lot of these are pretty similar. So what I want to do right now, because again, I'm trying to figure out the size of our 35S Amplicon approximately. So I'm not really going to concern myself with uh, all of these different sort of details. All I want to focus on is one of the 35Ss. So I happen to notice this one here, cloning vector 35S GFP. So let's click on this one. So that will bring us further down and it will show us a more uh, sort of up close image of our, of our data set. So we're basically just looking at this region right here, wherever I, whatever I have highlighted. So from here to here, basically. And notice that there are two matches within this particular, um, within this particular uh, entry in GenBank. So you have one range match here, and you have one range match here. So do you guys have any idea what that might be? Why are there two different range matches? So if you're thinking that it has to do with the forward and reverse primer, you would be correct. So yes, one of these represents the forward primer, and one of them represents the reverse primer, the ones that we entered. Notice that the alignment is actually laid out right here for you for each of those different matches. So we've got our query up here and we've got our subject right below it. So our query is the primer that we entered into the search tool in BLAST. So here is one, one set from, and the, the numbers here indicate the positions or the, the basically the position and the number of base pairs. So this is the 25th base pair to the 49th base pair. And then down here we have the first to the 22nd base pair. So I guess this is the first one that I entered, and that's the second one. Um, they correspond to positions on our subject. So notice that um, they are binding to the, so for example, the, uh, this, guy, this guy right down here, this primer, uh, 1 to 22 here, is binding to the 3,644th base pair up to the 3,665th base pair. And then over here, we have this guy binding to the three. 1,780 first base pair all the way on up to the 3,805th base pair. Okay, so this is giving you kind of an idea of where the forward and reverse primers are binding. So now, how do we figure out the size of our amplicon using this information? So I'm going to tell you, you can, most definitely. So real quick, I'm going to go back to that image that I shared with you before on the smart board for what it's worth, even though it's not very good image. There we go. And remember, we have our forward primer binding here being amplified this way, right up to here. Then we have our reverse primer being amplified in this direction, right up to here. So this represents the first site of binding for our first for our forward primer. And this represents over here at the end of the square, the last site of binding for our uh, reverse primer. So if we go back to GenBank, how do we get that size of the amplicon? Well, you can imagine that our subject right here, both here and here actually, is kind of like, it's kind of like the, it's basically representing the size of the amplicon. 
So from the first site of the binding, from the first base pair, all the way on up to the last set of base pair, that's going to be the last base pair, rather, that's going to be our, our, uh, the size of our amplicon. So all we have to do is figure out where the largest, where the furthest base pair is and where the, the sort of the most downstream base pair is or where it's bound and where the most upstream base pair is bound to figure out both the, uh, the beginning and the end of our amplicon. That will give us the total size. So basically we're just gonna look for the largest and the smallest number. So on our uh, alignments here, I noticed that I have 3,805 and at a high and then down here I have 3,644 at a low. So it turns out that these represent, the subtraction of these actually represent our, our total size or our amplicon. So I'm going to subtract the, the smallest position from the largest. So I'm going to do 3,805 minus 3,644. And if you do the math, what you come up with is 161. So basically between here and here, there are 161 base pairs. So essentially, that tells us the size of our amplicon. So imagine right here, let me go back to my image here. This represents like the 3,644th position, and this represents the 3,805th position on that subject that we found in GenBank, that cloning vector. Therefore, all I have to do is subtract to figure out the total size. So I'm gonna go ahead and do 3805 minus 3644, which equals 161. Now, is that actually the size of our amplicon, however? Remember, these correspond to positions. So you actually have to add one one base pair. That's actually the size of our amplicon. The reason for that is because these represent positions. So if you think about yourself being in a, you know, standing in a line of three people, for example, there are three people standing in the line, but if you're the middle person, you're technically the second person in line. You're number two. If that makes any sense. You have to add one more just to account for that position. So technically the total size of our, our amplicon is 162 base pairs. Not that it really matters that much because honestly gel electrophoresis isn't going to, re the, this type of gel electrophoresis isn't going to be able to tell the difference between 161 and 162. So you can go ahead and repeat the same process for the other set of primers. So the one that was in my presentation here um, had to have been 35S. So you'll find that if you copy and paste and go through the same process on uh, in GenBank um, with the other set of primers, uh, that will be for tubulin. Now, spoiler alert, I'm going to tell you what the sizes are just for the purposes of moving on with this presentation. So the 35S is 162 and tubulin is 187 base pairs in length. Actually 187 to like 190, depending on your what you find in GenBank. But we like to say 187. So basically, the 35S is a little tiny bit smaller than our, um, our tubulum. So what does that mean for the gel? <clears throat> so let's go back to our presentation here. Oops, sorry, I shared the screen with you guys. All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, there we go. All right, so what does that mean for our gene of interest? Oh, I mean, sorry, what does that mean for our, uh, our gels? So right up here, because we've just calculated the size of the amplicons, I'm gonna kind of tell you what we should expect to see on our results. So if you direct your attention to the top gel in our image here, this is kind of like our control. Okay, so this is kind of like the, the, the GM corn and the non-GM corn that I use for the controls in this experiment. Except here, they're using wild type soy and Roundup Ready soy. So Roundup Ready soy, remember Roundup Ready is that HT, that herbicide resistance um, soy. So this is technically genetic mo genetically modified and then our wild type is not. 
It's like wild um, what you would find in the wild. So notice that the gels have been loaded in the same way that I loaded them. The only difference is they're using a little bit of a different marker. The idea is the same. This marker here just represents a, um, uh, it's a different type of marker more or less, but we can still predict the size of the different uh, fragments in our gel. So our marker is going to look a little bit different. But what you should notice here though, is for our wild type soy, we have uh, our tubulin amplification looking very good. So basically we see one fragment here. And the reason that we see one band on the gel is because everything that came out of that PCR should have just been tubulin. So we only amplified tubulin, therefore that's all we're going to see on the gel. And because tubulin is represents a, a, a region of rather an amplicon of 187 base pairs in size. Therefore, we should have one fragment of tubulin, one band of tubulin, all at the same size. So we see very good amplification here. For our 35S lane, however, we don't see anything. And that's to be expected because we're using wild type soy, remember. Wild type soy should not have any 35S modification because it's wild, right? Humans haven't incorporated that 35S promoter into wild type soy. So therefore we should not see any amplification here. So that's what we should expect for a wild type or a non GMO uh, um, product. Over here, we have our Roundup Ready soy. And as you can see, tubulin looks good. And over here, we have our 35S band looking a little tiny bit lower uh, than our tubulin. And that's exactly what we should expect for something that's been modified or genetically modified because this represents that 35S promoter that's clearly been incorporated into a plasmid which would contain our HT gene or incorporate into whatever, whatever recombinant DNA has been inserted into this plant. Pretty cool. So that's, that, those are our controls. So this is what we should hope to see for our controls as well. So our, our plus GMO corn should look like this and our wild type corn should look like this. So now for our food products. So down here, we can essentially say that this is kind of like our veggie straw, right? Remember veggie straw was labeled as non-GMO to begin with. So I should expect to see good amplification for tubulin. Veggie straws are made from potato, by the way. Uh, and uh, I should also see no 35S because they're claiming to be non-GMO. Therefore, they should not have 35S. The cheesy corn chip, however, should have both tubulin and 35S because, or might have, I should say, uh, tubulin and 35S just because it might contain genetically modified corn. So our gel is just about done. It's got another like five minutes or so. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'm not sure that you guys are going to be able to really see the gel anyway. So I went ahead and did this gel last night and took pictures of it. So I already know what we are going to be seeing here. Uh, but I wanted to kind of show you how it looks when we take a look at the gel underneath the black light or in a UV illuminator, I should say. So this is a little sort of handheld illuminator and it projects a UV light from the bottom here. And then this is just a protective uh, layer that will essentially protect our eyes so that we can actually, we don't actually burn our eyes out essentially um, when we look at directly at the blue light. So I'm gonna just stop my gel box prematurely here we got our gel. Okay. So what you can kind of see on the camera here, I think you guys can see that. What you can kind of see on the camera here, hmm. yeah, I'll take it off of this. You see these little sort of purple bars, right? So those purple bars, a lot of the time students think that that's actually our DNA. That's not our DNA. That just simply represents uh, the dye that was contained within the, uh, within the little PCR tubes, that pink color that I, I showed you yesterday and today. Um, that's just a dye and that serves the same purpose as, it's like a loading dye. It serves the same purpose as a dye that we may have used, that we used in uh, our restriction analysis lab last week. So check that out on DNALC Live if you want to review on uh, how to or what that purpose of that dye is. But that just basically tells you that the, the gel ran more or less. So we need that UV light in order to actually visualize our product. So I'm going to basically slide the gel off here and I'm going to put it right onto that illuminator box. 
and again, it's going to be kind of hard for you guys to see just because I'm in my living room or dining room here. There's a lot of, hang on one sec, let me just sort of wipe this off. It's got a little condensation on it. Hold on one sec, guys. So basically, we see everything that we should, we expected to see. Yeah, I don't think you guys are going to be able to see that. No worries. I'm going to go ahead and just post an image up on the board for you. It's going to show you the same thing anyway. But basically, um, what you should see here are little tiny sort of green bands. And those green bands represent the same thing that you saw on that ideal gel that I just showed you. They're, those, are, those are basically our DNA, our amplicons. So let's take a look. <clears throat> All right, so here are our results from yesterday. Now, bear with me. I don't have access to our sort of editing tools and a better camera, and it's pretty bright here. And this little illuminator is not the best at um, doing its job. So these look a little bit more faint than they should. However, we do see everything that we expect to see. So here's our ladder right here. Um, so this is a 100 base pair ladder, remember, so that up here we have um, DNA around 1,000 base pairs in length. Then we go down, every single band represents a, a difference of about 100, and we go all the way down to about 100. So for our positive and negative control, so this is our plus GMO corn. Here's our tubulin. So tubulin is exactly where we expect, right around the 200 base pair mark, because tubulin is 187 base pairs in length. Then for our 35S, interestingly, we have two amplicons. We have one here and we have one here. So what's up with that? Interestingly, what this shows is that not only is there one 35S promoter in this particular uh, GM uh, lineage, there is a second 35S promoter that's been incorporated. So literally, sometimes what they'll do is they'll put in multiple 35S promoters just to guarantee that whatever, to like really, really make sure that, that the expression of whatever it is that they've, they're incorporating into the plant um, is expressed. So that's what this is showing. So that's not unexpected. That's actually pretty normal. Now for our um, negative control, our wild type corn here, I do have amplification here. It's pretty faint. And unfortunately, the, the corn that I used was the leaf was kind of old, um, but I wanted to use wild type corn. I mean, I could have easily have just taken a plant from my garden that, sh that theoretically shouldn't have any genetic modification, but I wanted to use the corn just to prove a point. So um, our our GM our not our wild type corn here, there is amplification for tubulin, but there, there isn't really anything here for 35S. Now, I don't know if I would really take uh, this result too reliably just because the amplification is so low for tubulin, but Either way, I would say that that uh, this is what we would expect. Now, let's take a look at our cheesy corn chip as well as our veggie straw. So cheesy corn chip, this is pretty good amplification. The latter looks a lot better in this image here as well compared to the other one. That might have been my fault for the way I took the picture, my bad. But uh, notice that for the cheesy corn chip, we have our tubulin amplification and we also have our 35S amplification. In fact, we have multiple promoters. That's actually the reason why I chose the cheesy corn chip, just because uh, this is a result that we pretty much always see. We see multiple different bands for our, um, um, we see multiple different bands for our, uh, for this particular product. Now, unfortunately, the veggie straw, there was no amplification at all. So I see nothing for tubulin and I see nothing for 35 S. And I actually repeated this a second time last night and got the same result. This is pretty interesting. So this kind of highlights the, the difficulty with this sort of experiment. If you remember from part one, I told you this is one of the most difficult labs that we do just because uh, extracting DNA from a, a, a processed food, uh, a processed plant product can be pretty difficult when you think about it. 
And it turns out that this just failed all around. I didn't get any sort of amplification out of my veggie straw, but that's okay. That's science. That's the process of science. And so this is an inconclusive test. We got no tubulin, meaning that no tubulin amplification, meaning that we cannot really conclude anything about 35S as well. But let's just assume that they are non-GMO just because uh, the package was labeled as such. Now, I happen to have a, right before everyone went on sort of lockdown, we had a couple of, of uh, classes come through do, and uh, they did the GMO lab with us at the learning center and both of them had some excellent results. So I wanted to go through at least one set of results here just to hammer that point home. So this is from a student team at the beginning of March from uh, one of our high school groups and the results look beautiful. Uh, here we have our ladder, we have our 100 base pair, we have our 200, we have our 100 base pair band here, we have our 200 base pair band here, and right over here we have our tubulin for this student's product, and I believe this student did a clementine, orange. Um, so that's something that we often don't have good amplification from. That's the other thing, like when we get, when we try to do extra, DNA extraction from actual fruits or seeds or nuts, it tends not to work so well. We usually have to use leaf material or, or different parts of the fruit. And I think this student, student used some of the, the sort of white stringy stuff on the inside of the clementine, as well as I think a piece of the skin, if I recall. I don't really actually remember exactly. But either way, interestingly, they got tubulin amplification and he also got um, uh, great 35S amplification. Not only did he get one band, one solid amplicon here, he also got a second band as well. This student had a similar sort of result. We have amplification for 35S, double bands again. So that means that this product incorporated multiple different promoters, multiple different 35S promoters. And uh, the tubulin, however, was a little bit on the light side. So I, I wanted to show you this just to show you that sometimes, uh, even if you get good amplification for one of these, you may not get good amplification for the other. And that's just sort of the how PCR works. It's just sort of a reality. Um, but last but not least, here we have a non-GMO product. And the reason that I say this is non-GMO is because we have a, a tubulin amplification here. It's decent amplification, not the best, but um, definitely there. And we have nothing for 35S here, uh, indicating that this was a non-GMO. So theoretically, that's what the veggie straw should have looked like. In fact, I think this was one of those vegetable chip products. Um, but anyway, so those are the results. And before we finish our discussion of genetically modified organisms, I thought it would be interesting, it would be good to end on this note. And, you know, again, I mentioned yesterday that there's a lot of sort of discussion about whether or not genetically modified organisms are bad or, you know, are they good or whatever, you know, and I, I don't want to take, you know, sides necessarily, um, but I want to just sort of lay out all of the different benefits as well as issues that might, uh, might arise with the use of genetically modified organisms. And you know you should use this as a as a good time to sort of brainstorm some of these some of the possible benefits as well as some of the possible issues with genetically modified organisms, and try your hardest to think about both sides because a lot of the a lot of times the phrase G uh, GMO is just bad it has a negative connotation but there are definitely many significant benefits uh, with using GMO uh, uh, GM genetically modified products and I'm going to just fill in a list that we've come up with here at the Learning Center for uh, on both sides of the of the argument here. Um, and so, you know, it's pretty clear that when we talk about genetic mod uh, GMO crops or GM crops, pest resistance and herbicide tolerance, as well as disease tolerance, are, are some of the biggest and most influential um, sort of benefits that come out of genetic modification. But you can do other things as well. You can also also incorporate genes that confer resistance to particular types of environments, especially with climate change and uh, different environments changing pretty dramatically in terms of temperature, average daily temperature, or uh, amount of ra rainfall or precipitation. Things like drought resistance or being able to survive a shock, cold shock or something like that, those are pretty critical traits that um, can make or break a farmer, especially in a, a part of the world that, that you know, farming is 100% their livelihood and without, without, if their crop fails, then they could be in serious trouble. Um, so, you know, when you think about it, this is sort of an important, uh, important point here. 
uh, not only that, but you can increase nutritional value, especially in those those areas of the world that where where perhaps land is at a shortage or um, um, or even nutrients is that are at a shortage, like a desert region or something like that, allowing uh, farmers to grow crops in places that they never could before. Uh, of course, there are a lot of issues as well, and we sort of touched on those yesterday. So we, you know, inadvertently, when we incorporate these different traits into organisms, um, you know, there might be un unforeseen sort of effects on the environment. In particular, we could imagine a, a situation, I, I forgot if I went over this yesterday or not, but uh, with genetically modified corn, for example. So as it turned out, when uh, an agricultural firm first started using genetically modified corn in their uh, some of their crops, the corn went to the pollen. And so this was a BT corn, by the way, and the corn went to produce pollen and it released its pollen into the environment. It got scattered across a wide area and uh, it turned out the pollen also expressed that BT toxin. And monarch butterfly caterpillars who were feeding sort of away from the crops wound up ingesting that pollen and they also got they got exposed to that toxin as well and it wound up killing monarch butterfly caterpillars. So, you know, we can imagine that, you know, that's something that I, I would imagine that, that they didn't necessarily think was going to happen, but it is definitely a something to think about. Um, and so also when we're, we're making these super powerful, super resistant crops, don't forget evolution is still at work and still at play. And so even if you incorporate a gene for BT production in a, in a, a crop, that will kill Lepidoptera and caterpillars, chances are it's not going to kill every single caterpillar. There may be caterpillars in that population that can deal with that particular particular toxin because they have genes that will convert, that will build proteins that will help them resist that toxin. And so what winds up happening is you are artificially selecting for those, those pests with those resistant genes, and you are in uh, danger of creating something like a super pest that you can no longer deal with with by traditional means so bt may not may not work at all the same could be said for uh weeds as well as for um uh plant disease as well and so there are, there are definitely some so a lot of issues with regard to that uh there are health concerns as well but you know there's a lot of you know nothing really too significant has been found that in terms of, of uh genetic modification linked to human health health. It's a lot of correlation and things like that. And there's really not the, 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 the jury is still out. Not that I, I, I think we should go forward and, and go ahead and just, you know, make every, you know, incorporate genetic modification into every single crop out there. Um, but I, there is definitely a good middle ground between, I think, both the, both sides of the argument. Here. And so uh, just as a fun little um, sort of game here, I wanted to see if you guys could figure out what some of the top GMO foods are, or the top I should say crops that contain genetic modification. And based on the what we were talking about today, it's probably obvious what some of them are. So I mentioned soy and corn as well, but you might be surprised to see some of the other top genetically modified crops out there. So rice, peas, papaya. Papaya is one that always makes always surprises our students. Um, tomatoes as well. So uh, you should uh, take a look at our the pre-lab exercise for part one of our DNA LC live series here. There's an exercise that talks about one of the scientists at the lab, at the at Cold Spring Harbor lab, Laboratory rather, named Zach Lipman, who does work on genetic modification in um, tomatoes and their relatives. You should definitely take a look at that if you're more, if you're interested in this. And uh, the other thing too is Always keep in mind that labeling and identifying something as GMO is is kind of a marketing game as well. Um, so again, the the phrase G GMO is has like a negative connotation, and I think in the especially in the United States, and I think when people see that phrase non-GMO, they think it's for some reason inherently better. And I'm not saying that it is or it isn't, but you know, it's just a it's a marketing thing, you know. And in various different countries throughout the world. Um, the labeling requirements will vary from country to country. So in the United States, we have no labeling uh, requirements re with regard to GMOs. And uh, other countries do, however. And so this kind of summarizes some of the, the different requirements across the globe. So basically, in the United States, I would interpret that to mean that 
companies who want to put non-GMO on their product can almost use that as a selling point, as opposed to you would not want to put GMO, the fact that it is GMO on your product is going to be something that consumers may not want to purchase just because of the negative connotation. Same thing could be said for organic labeling as well. And, you know, it's always, I, you know, I always, <laughs> always makes me laugh with organic foods and things like that, because, you know, what is technically organic actually, you know, it, it's hard to really say. And uh, if you use a chemical uh, on your, in your crop, for example, that is derived naturally, it's technically, it can still technically be labeled as organic. So you can still use pesticides or chemicals in your crop, but it just, as long as they're natural, that's fine. Um, so again, it's all about a game a little, little bit, uh, marketing game a little bit, but um, just to put it in perspective for you, this is a sort of a, a graphic of the world population increasing, a projected uh, increase in the world population. And when, when we think about developing ways to grow foods and crops that can meet that rising population, you know, it's, it, you kind of back yourself into a wall a little bit you know, you kind of see that genetic modification might really have some profound uh, importance, especially in the future. So again, it's all about, you know, your perspective. And I always, this is something that as a naturalist, I'm, I'm, you know, I love insects and butterflies and things like that. I'm definitely a naturalist, but I always say that crops, gardens, farms, inherently, those are not natural. They're all man-made. So whether you do quote unquote organic farming or not, you're still affecting the environment, you're still modifying an environment to suit your needs. Um, you know, a natural environment is is something that just, in my interpretation, is something that can come about without the influence of humans. And uh, so anyway, that's just sort of my, my take on GMOs. I think there's definitely a middle ground. Um, anyway, so I hope you enjoyed our presentation, our part one and part two of our genetic uh, detecting genetically modified foods through PCR laboratory. I would encourage you to come join us at the Learning Center in the future to, to carry out this lab on your own uh, or reach out to us to try to do it in your home if you can. We might be able to send you the reagents. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day.